Amen. Well, you can be seated. And if you have a Bible with you, you can open up to the book of James. As we've uh, been here for, for quite a long time, we've just been hanging out here and, and looking at what the Holy Spirit used James to say to these churches that he was writing to. So we're going to be in James chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 13. Uh, the scriptures that are going to be up on the screen tonight, because they're using a different computer, they're not going to match exactly uh, the same as, as mine. It's a different version, but it'll be the same, and it'll uh, do just as well nonetheless. How many of you uh, got to enjoy some of the sunshine today? How many of you uh, thanked God for the sunshine today? It's still February. We realize that, right? It's, it's still February, and uh, we had a, a, a day that was in 60. In fact, we've had a couple days that have been uh, mid-50s or even low 60s. So I, I praise God for a beautiful day and, and even uh, singing the song before that last one, singing You're Beautiful and, and looking at all of creation, especially a, a sunny day and when the summer comes, the, the blue skies, the green grass, all of creation proclaims uh, the handiwork and the glory of God, and uh, we got to be open to seeing it and enjoying every everyday graces that are given by God. Sometimes we, we look for miracles, we look for things that are out of the ordinary, but really every single day is a miracle. Every, every single thing that we experience that is good, that is full of joy, full of laughter, it's a gift from God's hand, and uh, we have to be willing to, to see that and to recognize it. Well, if you're in uh, James chapter 3, starting at verse 13, we're going to read verses uh, 13 through 18. This uh, little segment of scripture talking about wisdom. So the, uh, the passage tonight is about wisdom. The sermon title for tonight is Man's Wisdom and God's Wisdom. And we're going to be kind of looking at the two as James gives them to us. So let's read this together. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then it's peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's word. I think all of us uh, in this room tonight, and, and most people, if not all people on the face of, of this earth, are, are looking to have a good, successful life. They're, they're looking to find happiness. They're looking to find peace. They're looking to find uh, something worth living for. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to try to have the most terrible life that I can possibly have and live the worst life possible. Nobody thinks like that. It's just not in our human nature. Our human nature uh, compels us to try to find something to latch onto, to try to find something that gives us enjoyment, something that gives us happiness. In other words, a successful life. Now, even within this room, I'm willing to bet that if I interviewed each of you individually, you would probably give me a, a different definition than somebody else would of a successful life or of a good life. And, and that's probably true for most people. It's going to differ from person to person. But in general, there, there's two ways that we really can look at things. There's a, a worldly view, a, a worldly version of what success looks like, a, a worldly view, version of, of what a good life looks like. Even specifically, that, that differs from culture to culture. But we know in our culture what uh, the world says or what our culture, what our, uh, the people in our country say is a good life, don't we? It's all about uh, having uh, your, your wallets full, your bank account full. It's about living a, an easy, comfortable life. It's about having a, a nice house, a, a life of uh, relative ease as far as not having too many difficulties, a, a nice spouse, a, a nice family. You want your kids to grow up uh, and, and be uh, productive in society. We could go on and on and on. We want a, an early retirement. We want uh, vacations in nice places. This is kind of what we would know as the American dream. Now, some of those things I mentioned, they're not bad things. They're not intrinsically evil or wrong. But at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, if the world is pursuing these things, if the world is, is constantly trying to attain these things, then should Christians be doing the same? Or is it different for Christians? 
Do, do Christians have something that they're pursuing that's different? And I think the answer should be yes. That God's view of a successful life, God's view of a, a good life, should differ from someone that does not know Christ. There should be a difference. But the bottom line is, for someone to pursue a good life, pursue a successful life, to, to get to their achievements, whatever those achievements may be, whatever those dreams, visions, aspirations may be, they need what to do that? They need wisdom. They need wisdom to navigate through life. They need wisdom to make the right decisions, to, to make the right choices, to put themselves on a path, path to success, right? So no matter whether you're a Christian or not, all of us need wisdom. We need wisdom to navigate through the everyday life. Now, wisdom is, is not the same as knowledge. How many know you can have knowledge and not be a wise person? I, I've... Uh, I was thinking about this a little bit, and it's kind of like the analogy with somebody who has book smarts but doesn't have a lot of common sense, right? How many of you have ever met somebody like that? They're extremely, extremely intelligent, but they just do the dumbest stuff ever. Like, they, they know a lot of facts about a lot of different things, but they just make stupid decisions. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us in here have met somebody like that. Maybe some of us in here are those people. I won't, I won't uh, make you raise your hand if you think that you're that person. You're probably not willing to admit it anyway, but... Knowledge is different from wisdom because wisdom is really, it's possessing knowledge, it's possessing understanding, but putting that into practice in your everyday life. It's making the right decisions. In other words, it's knowing what is right and actually doing it. Knowing the right thing to do and actually doing it. So in the midst of a world that's changing, in the midst of temptations, in the midst of distractions, you have an understanding of what needs to be done and you have the ability to carry it out, the ability to, to do it. Now, even in this idea of wisdom, there are two different wisdoms. Now, in the same way that there's two different successes or two different good lives that you could compare between the world and between God, in the same way there's a wisdom that comes with the world. In other words, it's kind of like a worldview, a way of thinking, if you like to call it that. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs, now if you've ever read Proverbs, I can't even just give you a definition of wisdom because the entire book of Proverbs defines wisdom. So it's 31 chapters, or 30 chapters, 30 or 31, who knows? 31, 31. okay, that's what I thought. One for every day of the month, I knew that. 31 chapters, and, and all of those chapters talk about wisdom as it relates to everyday life, as it relates to different situations, as it relates to a personal application. But one of those Proverbs, Proverbs 9, 10 through 12, it says this. It says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. So, so what is that saying? It's uh, real quick. It's basically saying that it starts with God. Real wisdom, real understanding comes with fear of the Lord. In our culture, we have uh, bad connotations that come with the idea of, of being fearful of the Lord. It's a reverent fear, a respect, an, an admiration where you submit to God's authority. But it goes on and says knowledge of the Holy One. So understanding of who God is, understanding of what God has done on our behalf that's how we begin to understand what wisdom is. But it goes on and says, For by me your days will be multiplied and your years will be added. This tells me that wisdom comes with blessing. And, and like I said, if you read Proverbs, you will find very quickly that uh, Solomon and, and the other writers of the Proverbs, they would attribute that when you have wisdom, when you walk in God's ways, there's blessing that comes upon that. So that's what it's saying. But then it also says, if you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. This means that we are in control as far as the decisions that we make. We can yield to the wisdom of God, or we can scoff at it. We can laugh at it. We can turn our backs to God but it says we alone will bear it. In other words, whether we choose to walk in God's wisdom or not is up to us. And the consequences of those actions, the consequences of those decisions will be seen accordingly to the way uh, that we choose to go. Now, I want to look at Jameson. I want to break this down. The first thing in verse 13 that he says is basically, who has wisdom and how do we know that they have it? Now, if I were to ask all of you in here tonight to, to think of somebody that you know that you would call wise, I'm sure all of us could think of somebody, somebody that we look up to, somebody that we at one time maybe aspired to be like, somebody whose lifestyle resembled a life of wisdom. 
Could everybody maybe do that? Could everybody think of somebody on their mind that they could come up with, that they would look up to, somebody that they think is wise? Now, how would you know if somebody is wise? We know that somebody is wise not because they say they're wise, right? See, the person that you're going to follow, the person that you're going to look up to as a role model is not just going to be somebody who says that they're wise, right? You can say that you're wise all that you want, but your lifestyle ultimately either uh, approves of that statement or it betrays it. But the bottom line is really, if you say that you're wise in your own sight, you're probably not wise, right? If you're, if you're boasting about it, if you're saying that you're a wise person, uh, you're probably not wise. In fact, you know, James kind of gives us what it looks like to be wise. But somebody that, that's wise, somebody that we look up to, it's shown in everyday application. It's shown by their lifestyle. It's shown by their character. It's shown by their, their personality and the things that they do. Um, usually those people are humble, right? Somebody that has a lot of wisdom, usually they're humble. Usually they're not talking about themselves a lot. They're not talking about how smart or how wise they are. Rather, they just humbly live in a way that we desire to impersonate. It looks like a successful lifestyle. It looks like somebody who knows what's going on and they know uh, how to get somewhere in life. Now, when you look at this passage, James basically asks this rhetorical question, who is wise in understanding among you? He, he doesn't expect an answer necessarily. He's, he's saying, he answers his own, his own question, he says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. In other words, I'm not looking for an answer because if you raise your hand and you say you're wise, you've already missed the point. Because wisdom is shown in good conduct. Wisdom is shown by the decisions that you make. Now, good conduct, in this case, it means somebody who's, who's loving. You know, uh, the theme of James always talks about loving your neighbor, loving people. So good conduct means showing the, 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 the marks of Christ in your life, loving people, being honorable, being selfless. But then it goes on and says works. So looking at our, our lifestyle, looking at our decisions, meaning that the things that we do, the decisions that we make, the choices that we make, they're not negligent, they're not reckless. That's one of the first things that, I, that comes to mind with somebody who's not wise is somebody who makes negligent decisions. Somebody that is not really paying attention, somebody that's reckless. You know, oftentimes I think of teenagers fit this bill perfectly because they have this indestructible mindset where they feel like nothing can hurt them. And they live, a, live life a little bit recklessly. Now, those of us who are a little bit older, those of you who are a little bit older, I'm still pretty young, so uh, I don't have a lot of wisdom. But, <laughs> wait, wisdom comes from God, so... Uh, I'll take that back. Wisdom doesn't come from, from age. But the point is, many of you who are older, you've, you've been through the ropes a little bit. You've experienced some things. You've, you've made some bad decisions. You've made some good decisions. You've had enough time on this earth to realize where wisdom comes from, to realize what wise decisions look like. But James here is, is concerned about works. He's concerned about conduct, concerned about lifestyle. But then he also says the attitude that we do it. Look what it says in verse 13. It says, in the meekness of wisdom. So that's just like I said, humility. You know, somebody who's wise is not somebody who's arrogant, somebody who's boasting, somebody who's always talking about themselves, or somebody who's conceited. It's selfless. It's, it's humble. It's gentle. So wisdom is not arrogantly claimed, but humbly shown in our attitude, in our actions, and, and it's really knowing where we're supposed to be going, knowing what we're supposed to do, and having the fortitude, having the strength, having the ability to do it, to carry it out. That's what wisdom is. Now, the second point, James spends a lot of his time showing us the, the falsehood and the danger of worldly wisdom. And I think he does this is because there's a lot of people out there that are deceived. As I mentioned last week, uh, one of the dominant themes in the book of James is self-deception. That the, the people that he is writing to, he is concerned that they have been deceived. Concerned that they've been deceiving themselves into believing that they're saved or believing that they've been living a lifestyle that's honoring to God. But in reality, that's just not the case. So... The falsehood and danger of worldly wisdom is what he spends a lot of his time kind of displaying to show people, to unveil the deceit that sometimes people get caught up in. I want to read a verse before we kind of get into this, though. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19, it says this. Now, this is uh, uh, the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthians, but he says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool 
that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is folly with God, or foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in the craftiness. So this tells us that there is a, a difference in godly wisdom and the wisdom of man, or worldly wisdom. See, God is saying that those people who think they have understanding, they think they know what's going on, they think they have what it takes to live a successful life, if they're going by worldly wisdom, in the eyes of God, that's foolishness, it's stupidity. This is not the wisdom that's going to lead to, to a true, lead to a true abundant life as God sees it. So the, the truth is the right way is not really relative. You know, we live in a culture where it's kind of like, you know, do your own thing, go your own way, find out what works best for you, right? That's our culture's mindset. But the reality is, even though there's two options, there's only one way that actually works. Guess whose way it is? Not ours. It's God's ways. See, God created things to work a certain way. He created, you know, our, our physical bodies to work a certain way, but he also created our, our dialogues, our relationships with people, our relationships with him. All of it was created for a specific purpose. You know, he, he created our identity and our purpose as individuals. This is such a huge thing in our culture because there are so many people looking to, to find out who they are, what, what the point of life is, what their meaning uh, is all about, or the meaning of their existence is all about. You know, God gives us our identity and purpose. And in addition to that, he, he can give us the wisdom to do the right things. He can lead us to the path of life. Now, at the same time, we have the tendency and the choice as human beings to do what? To either accept or reject God's ways. God gives us the choice. You know, we can choose to submit to him. We can choose to do the things that he's called us to do, or we can choose to turn our backs on him and, and to do our own thing and to go our own way. Now, the truth is all of us have done this. That's why when the Bible says all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, and then in Isaiah it says that all we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. We've all gone our own way. We've all thought that we were wise in our own sight. We've all thought that we had it figured out and that we knew better. But when we choose the world's way of thinking, ultimately what we do is we allow the world and we allow the culture to shape our thinking when it comes to who we're supposed to be. You know, we look at the world and we begin to have these thoughts about ourselves. I need to do this or I have to do this. I have to become this person because this is what the world, this is what the culture says that I need to do. In addition to that, we can allow it to uh, get our interest to the point where now we're pursuing worldly things. Our wisdom has been shifted to, to where we think to, to achieve success, to get to where the world says we need to get, we need to do the things that they say we need to do. We need to go by the world's version of success. We need to let the world tell us how to get there. See, I think we as believers oftentimes underestimate the amount that the world that we live in influences us. You know, the media, the news, the, even social media, whatever it may be, the people that we hang out with, there's so many ways that we are influenced. And in addition to that, we know that the reality of spiritual warfare is there. That there are demonic powers that desire to, to sift us, in the words of Jesus, sift us like wheat. Desire to distract us, desire to take us on a different path of so-called success. See, and sometimes these things aren't even evil, they're not even wrong, it's just that they are misdirected. So that we're not pursuing the things of God, but that we're pursuing the things of the world. Now, I want you to look at how James explains this. We're going to read uh, verse 14 through 16. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. See, what James is describing there is, is the worldly way of thinking. You know, it talks about uh, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. You know, if this is our, our motivating factor to get where we want to be in life, then we're already self-deceived. He says you're not wise. Don't, don't, don't boast and be false to the truth because you're not. You're not wise. If you're being driven by selfish ambition, if you're being driven by jealousy, 
or, or comparison, we could say. See, that's a huge sickness in our culture today, comparison. We look around to the people next to us. We look around to somebody who we deem as successful, something that they have or something that they've done, and we aspire to be like them. And a lot of times we allow this bitterness to grow in our hearts because we can't accomplish what they accomplished or we can't get what they've got. And then what happens? That bitterness becomes more ingrained in our hearts. Bitterness leads to more bitterness. That selfish ambition is really the trademark of our, of our culture. If I could think of one word to labor, label our, our modern day culture now in 21st century America, I would, I would say it would be selfish or individualistic. The world revolves around me, me, me. You know, every commercial that you see on TV that's advertising a product, how do they advertise it? It's all about you. It's all about what you need. It's all about what you want. This is the, the culture that we live in, and, and James is warning about this because this has been the, the root sin of, of all sins, is pride, the uh, inflation of self that's all about us. The, the root of all sin is that we want to become God of our own lives. And we want to push God off of his throne. That's what leads to all these other sins. So that's why James says that if we have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, we're doing the exact opposite of living a life in God's wisdom. We're actually going on a path that's totally opposed to that, totally separate to that. You know, and the Bible talks about for Christians, instead of being selfish and individualistic, we're supposed to be selfless. We're supposed to, to lay down our lives for others. In fact, in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says this, as Christians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What a world that we would live in if, if this actually dictated all of our decisions. Because all of us have a constant tendency and a constant battle to fight against our, our self-absorption, -absorp our egocentrism, where it's all about us, all about what I want, all about my feelings. All of us struggle with this, myself included. This is the, the daily battle. But James' point is that this is not the wisdom from God, rather this is wisdom that actually opposes God. The, the worldly way of wisdom, the worldly way of thinking actually opposes God. It actually opposes the message of the gospel itself. He says that it's not from above, if you see in, in verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. In other words, it's not from God. It's not displaying godly character. It's not showing godly pursuit. It's not showing that we desire to see Christ exalted and his kingdom furthered. It's all about ourselves. In fact, he, he gives three words that he uses to describe it, and they get progressively worse. The first one is he, he says it's earthly. This type of thinking, this, this frame of mind is earthly. What does he mean by that? He means it's driven by sinful desire. It's, it's driven by sinful desire, not only that, but it's, it's driven by temporal, vain pursuits. See, I mentioned earlier the, the American dream. See, none of those things are necessarily evil in and of themselves, but they make life all about us. They make life all about our pleasure. They make life as if we're never going to die. We're never going to see God face to face. See, James is warning these things. He's saying that we're living in a way that is earthly. It, it's temporal. It's vain has no meaning in the eyes of God. The second word gets a little bit worse. He says it's unspiritual. The word itself actually means void of God's spirit. In other words, it's showing that you really do not have the spirit of God. It's showing that the, the work of Christ is not being displayed in your life. You're, you're not bearing fruit. And if you're living life constantly being selfish, constantly being self-centered, you're showing that the spirit of God is not in you. showing no signs of, of God's work. It's unchristlike. And the last thing, which is the worst one, it says it's demonic. Who knew that having bitter jealousy and, and having selfish ambition, <clears throat> excuse me, being the driving factor 
of all that we do is actually demonic. Let me show you how it's demonic. As I mentioned before, the, the root of all sin is wanting to be God of our own lives. It's pride. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? How did the serpent deceive them? He said, God doesn't want you to eat this fruit because then you'll be like him. You'll be like God. In other words, Adam and Eve saw this as an opportunity to become wise. In fact, that's what it says. They saw that the, the fruit would make them wise. What an applicable verse to what we're talking about. But the root sin is that they wanted to be on the same level as God. They wanted to take things into their own hands. They thought that they knew better. In addition, it's just in step with Satan himself, flat out rebellion, flat out rejection of God. And not only that, but, but anti-gospel, as I said, instead of lay down your life for your brothers and sisters, instead of selfless service, instead of last will be first and the first will be last, it's all about you. Me, 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 I, 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 I'm going to make myself first no matter what. In that way, it's, it's demonic, it's unspiritual, it's earthly and showing that it's not from God, not from above. But then look what it says in the last verse of this part. Verse 16, it says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. You know, when you assert yourself, you ultimately trample other people. And I think of the, the stories that you hear uh, on, on Black Friday that there have actually been people that have gotten killed by being trampled by people trying to get into stores. That just is mind-boggling to me. But metaphorically speaking, this is the way that some people live their lives. They're willing to trample and hurt others to get where they need to get, to get what they want. So therefore, it causes disorder, you know, and it opposes the goal of harmony and reconciliation. That's the whole purpose of the gospel, as I say so often, to, to bring people together, to eliminate the hostility, to eliminate the dysfunction in relationships, to stop the disorder, to stop the chaos that we see in this world. You know, I'm a firm believer if that every person in this world lived a selfless lifestyle, a humble lifestyle, the lifestyle of a servant modeling the life of Jesus, there would be no violence. There would be no rape. There would be no murder. There would be no wars. We would live in a totally different place because the root of all those things is pride, the center of self. But in addition to causing disorder, James says it, it's the root of vile practices. You know, I think of the word vile, I think of something that's awful, something that's horrible, something that's sick, twisted, perverse. And that's exactly what it is. It's perverse, it's twisted, it's corrupt, the way that God intended things to be. You know, something else interesting about this, this word vile in, in the Greek, it could also mean worthless. As I mentioned before, oftentimes it's not the struggle as, as Christians with these things that are outright evil, outright sinful. It's just these things that distract us, these worthless pursuits, things that don't really matter. I've used this quote before. Uh, Francis Chan, he was a former pastor. He's still big in the ministry, a conference speaker. But he says, our biggest fear in life should not be failure, but at succeeding in things that don't really matter. See, that's, that's the big problem that we have, is that we set our sights on things that are far less than what God has intended us to pursue, doing things that are far less than God has intended us to do, being far less than what God has intended us to be. Because we sell out. We allow the, the worldly influence, the, the worldly way of wisdom take control. And we begin to pursue those things. See, I'm a firm believer that Satan, if he can't get you to, to uh, become addicted to something, he can't get you to get caught up in, in a secret life of sin, then what he'll do is he'll distract you and put all of these quote-unquote good things in your way to throw you off track, to throw you off the track. You see, there are a lot of things as Christians that we desire that are not bad, that just may not be necessarily glorifying to Christ, or they may not further his name, or further his mission, or further his kingdom. 
So when he says it leads to disorder and vile practice, he, he not only means that it's going to lead to further sin, for, further dysfunction, further dis division, he's, it's also going to lead to worthless pursuits. It's going to take us off track from where God calls us to be. And not only that, but it leads to bitterness. It leads to misery. It leads to dissatisfaction. You know, I'm a firm believer that there are many people out there that have the world's goods or have what the world labels as good, and yet they're still unhappy and unsatisfied because they've set their sights on a version of success that really can't give what it's promised. There, there are a lot of people out there that look at their lives and they say, well, you know, I got an education, I, I got a good job, I, I got a good spouse, I have a family, I have a, a nice home, and I have everything that I could possibly want. I have money set aside for early retirement, and, and we're going on all these vacations and all these different things, yet I still feel bitter, I still feel miserable, I still feel dissatisfied. That's because the world's version of a successful life is not God's version. In other words, we're, we're falling short of becoming the people that God has called us to be and experiencing the life that God wants us to have. You know that God wants us to have abundant life? You know, in John 10.10, 10, a famous verse that Jesus said he came to bring abundant life. And so often we, we get corrupted in the church and we think, well, Jesus wants me to have an abundant life, then he, he better give me a new car, or he better give me a better job, or he better give me a nicer house. But that's not necessarily the abundant life that he's talking about. As I've been saying, you know, God's version of a successful, good, abundant life is not the same as the world's. And it can't be found by the world's wisdom. The third part of this passage, James wants, James wants to show the, the truth and the life that are found in God's wisdom. You know, uh, even King Solomon knew his need for God's wisdom. I want to turn real quick to 1 Kings. When's the last time you've heard that book of the Bible being mentioned? 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, and then we're going to go through verse 9 through 13. Verse 5 says, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, ask what I shall give you. The Lord appeared to, to Solomon and said, ask me for something. Ask me what you want. You, you're, you're blessed by me, and I'm going to give you what you asked for. Now, what did Solomon ask for? Look down to verse 9, 9 through 13. It says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. You know, this, this passage amazes me, first and foremost, because Solomon could ask for anything that he wanted. And what did he ask for? Wisdom. He asked God for wisdom, said to discern between good and evil. In other words, to, to help him govern God's people. He wanted to be the best leader that he could be. He wanted to honor God in his position, which was what? King at the time. And God was so impressed, so pleased by his response that he gave him everything else as well. You know, scholars today would say that Solomon was probably the richest person that has ever lived on the face of the earth that he might not have just been a billionaire, but possibly a trillionaire because of his assets, if you translated them in today's currency. But Solomon realized his need, his greatest need, was for God's wisdom, for God's understanding, 
to do the things that God had called him to do. And that's got to be the same thing with us. Look at what it says here in this passage, verses 17 and 18. It says, but the wisdom from above, notice this is from above, this is from God, is first pure, then pure, pure. you know what? Pray for my tongue tonight. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, this is the wisdom that is focused on God. You know what it says in Colossians 3, 2? Paul says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. See, Solomon had his mind set on God and God's kingdom. He was concerned with ruling God's people the way that was pleasing to God. You know, in the same way we, we look at our lives, we may not be a king, we may not be like Solomon, but we should ask God for wisdom. We should ask God for, for discernment, for guidance, so that we can live lives that are holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God, so that we can do the things that God has called us to do and be the people that God has called us to be. We can't achieve this on our own strength. But then look what it says. It, it displayed, you know, godly wisdom, or wisdom that's from above is displayed in godly characteristics. And look what it says these characteristics are. The first one is, is pure. How many know that you cannot have pure motives until you have a pure heart, and you cannot have a pure heart until Christ has cleansed your heart? You know, last week we talked about uh, speaking this idea of, of blessing and cursing and the, the words that come out of our mouths, how they have great influence and great power. And I, I mentioned that oftentimes the reason we speak corrupt thoughts is because our corrupt hearts produces those things. The same way we can only approach God, we can only have purity and be pure when God cleanses us. But in addition to that, being pure means that we don't have any false underlying motives in other words, we, we don't do things for some ulterior motive where we're trying to get ahead in life. It's no longer about selfish ambition. It's about doing things that are pleasing to God and, and beneficial to our brothers and sisters and to those around us. There's no false underlying motives. It's simply pleasing to God. The second thing, the next three things rather, he says peaceable, gentle, and open to reason. So somebody who, who is a Christian walking in the wisdom of God should be desiring and fighting for peace and unity. You know, it amazes me how often we see Christians who have such great discord in their relationships. And all of us struggle with that at times, but they have discord in their relationships and they don't desire to fix it. They don't desire to reconcile. They don't desire to forgive and be forgiven. Godly wisdom is peaceable, fighting for peace and for unity, fighting for, for understanding and a desire to be civil, being intentionally inoffensive in the way that we talk to others and the things that we do. Did you get that? Intentionally inoffensive. You know, sometimes because I, I'm a, a very, uh, I can be a very brash person because I speak my mind, I have to watch this. I have to watch the way that I speak, the things that I do, that they would be intentionally inoffensive so that I could fight for peace, that I could fight for unity instead of discord and dysfunction. We should have a, a sensitivity towards others. It goes on and says that we should also be full of mercy and good fruits. What does this mean? It means that we should show kindness, show compassion, have concern for other people. This is how godly wisdom is evident in the lives of believers, that we would care about others, that we would display the, the fruit of God's love in our actions, in the way that we treat people, in the things that we do, even in the things that we don't do. And then it also says, being impartial and sincere. You know, we talked a, a little while ago, a few weeks ago, about partiality, meaning that we don't play favorites, we don't judge people by the way that the world views them. It's funny to me that James seems to be uh, disconnecting himself from the way that the world views wisdom. You know, in a, in a worldly mindset, it may be good to be partial. 
we may want to play favorites. We may want to give special attention to this person so that we can get to where we want to be or we can get the promotion that we need. Godly wisdom says that we don't show partiality. We don't play favorites. We're not unfair and unjust. We treat all people with love and compassion. But also being sincere, and this one gets me, it's not just about what we do, it's actually the motivations behind it. We can, we can walk through the motions and go through these things and do some of the things that we're mentioning, but if it's not sincere, then it doesn't really matter. We can be putting on a facade, being fake. In other words, James is saying that we should be real, be genuine in the things that we do, in the way that we treat people. And then lastly, verse 18 again, it says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In other words, the one who is righteous, the one who is displaying works of righteousness, first and foremost, is somebody that is at peace with God. In other words, they've been justified. They've been made in right relationship with God himself. There is no more hostility. Their sins have been forgiven. They've become a new creation. But second to that, true righteousness is displayed in every effort to make peace. You know, when we boil this down, really what it comes to is our relationship with God and our relationship with people. I mean, if we could sum up the totality of what life is really all about, that's really what it's all about. It's about knowing and being known by God, loving God and experiencing a relationship with Him. But it's also about loving people, having relationships with people. Really, that's what ministry should be all about, is people. Connecting people to the God who loves them. So righteousness is displayed in every effort to make peace with those around us. Whether that be somebody in our family that we have a dysfunctional relationship with, whether that be somebody who we've offended or somebody who has offended us. It doesn't matter the, the specific situation. A, a person walking in righteousness, walking by the Spirit of God is a person who desires to, to be at peace with those around them. And obviously, those who are at peace with God will want this. So that in and of itself is evidence. Do, do you have a desire to be at peace with those around you? Do you have a desire to, to make amends, to, to forgive and to be forgiven? Do you have a desire to see reconciliation happen, not only with you and your relationships, with, with those around you? Do you desire to see this happen? Because if you do, the, the point that James is making is this cannot be done when you have bitter jealousy. This cannot be done when you're being driven by selfish ambition. When you yourself are at the center, you're not going to be worried about peace. You're not going to be worried about what God thinks. You're not going to be worried about what happens with people or the people that you hurt in the process. You're only going to be worried about you. And James' point is this, is that when we embrace the message of the gospel, we realize that it's not about us. We realize that we don't know best. We realize that God's ways are higher. His ways are, are supreme. He knows better. There's a, a certain way to live where things are right. Things go the way that they're supposed to. And guess what? It's not the way that we come up with. See, many of us would like to think that, right? Our personal preferences, our, our personal desires, we would like to conform everybody around us to make that happen. But as I said, the reality is it's just not about us. I want to give you a quick story before we head towards the closing. Somebody that I, I won't mention that I've been talking to for, for quite a while, kind of counseling. He's become a friend. I've known him for a couple years now. But he was going through some relational issues. He, he made some, some serious mistakes in his own life. And, and what those mistakes ultimately led to was first some time in jail. I think he served about 30 days or around a month in jail. But then also he, he was disconnected from his fiance, from his children because of what he had done. And, and throughout this process, he called me quite a bit. He still calls me. We still talk about this, and, and things have been going much better. But what he would do is he would call me, and he would ask about the specific situation. He would ask, you know, what should I do with his, his fiance? How, how should I make things work? How can I get back together with her? How can I see my children again? And at the same time, he was asking some of his other friends for some advice. And I told him that 
you know, you have no right to assert yourself in this situation because of the things that you've done. You have no right to, to make demands in this situation that you're in because the consequences that you're facing have to do directly with your own actions. Yet at the same time, these other people that he was talking to were telling him to, you know, you need to go get a lawyer to, to get your kids. You need to do this and do that. And I told him, I said, if you do that, you will fract fracture your relationships to the point where you'll never get it back. You will cause more harm than good. Th the point was his, his friends were telling him to be assertive. They were telling him a, a way of wisdom that revolved totally around selfish ambition, to get what he wanted, regardless, about, regardless of thinking of what he had done, regardless of owning up to his consequences, owning up to his actions. You know what I told him? I, I told him to, what you need to do is you need to be humble. You need to go and you need to say you don't deserve anything. You need to, to go and acknowledge the wrong that you've done. You need to go in a spirit of patience, in a spirit of, of kindness. And I told him all these things, not because I have such great wisdom, but because I'm telling him what the Word of God says, the way that the Word of God teaches us to live and teaches us to interact. And a couple days after I had told him these things, and he had taken my advice to do this, he was surprised at how quickly things began to change, how quickly forgiveness began to happen, how quickly reconciliation began to happen, how quickly things began to change for the better because he was not uh, self-assertive, because he was not doing things in a brash manner and, and worried only about himself, but truly concerned with his children, truly concerned with his fiance. And he was amazed, and I told him, God's ways are never wrong. God's ways are never wrong. The problem is that so often we would rather do our own thing. We would rather, instead of submitting to him, trust in ourselves. But as I've been saying, God created the world. God created us. He created and designed every little thing. He knows how things are supposed to be. He knows how, how things are supposed to work. And I'm sure many of you here tonight could probably add testimonies like that one, that you could talk about circumstances in your lives where you had chosen to do things your own way and you had catastrophic consequences because of it. Yet you could also compare it to times where you had choosen, chosen to, to do things God's way and you were blessed in doing so. Things happened the way that you wanted them to happen not because you did things the way that you wanted to do them, but because you did things God's way, and he blessed you. You know, we as people, as Christians specifically, we need to be leery of the world's system of doing things. The way that the world says that things need to be done. We need to realize that, as James mentions, that jealousy and selfishness only lead to comparison and competition. They only lead us on a life that's a downward spiral where we're looking towards, looking at other people around us, looking at their version of success and trying to compete with them, trying to, to make our lives better. And as I said before, that only leads to disorder, dysfunction, destruction. It leads to bitterness. It leads to unhappiness. It leads to dissatisfaction. What it should do is it should lead us to forsaking trusting in our own ways. We have to stop thinking that we know best. We have to stop assuming that we know the way to go, and instead we have to acknowledge in humility our need for the wisdom of God. We have to go before God and say, God, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know the way to, to go. I don't know what I need to do in this situation. God, I need your wisdom. I need your direction. We need to pray and ask for his wisdom and divine guidance. And then we need to live it out. We need to do the things that the word of God teaches us to do. Do you know that God's ways are, are not burdensome or harmful? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God's ways are not burdensome and harmful? Do you believe that God really wants what's best for you? Because if you do, then you should make every effort to do things his way. See, so often we, we look at God's laws and we look at these commandments and we look at these things and we say, man, this is so difficult. This is so hard. Why do I have to do these things? 
And the voice of God's spirit says, because I love you, because I want what's best for you, because I know better and I know the consequences, the, the catastrophic consequences of your actions if you continue on the path that you're on. We need to, to realize, first and foremost, that God alone is the source of our joy and hope. Not these vain aspirations and, and dreams that align with the American dream and, and align with a worldly way of thinking, but that God himself is the source of our joy and hope. It also leads us to realize that loving others and healing relationships is what we're called to do as Christians. Making peace, making amends, bringing reconciliation to pass, explicitly showing the gospel in the way that we live and the way that we interact with people. In the same way that we were reconciled to God, we should be bringing people together instead of making it all about us. And as I said, it leads us to experience abundant life and peace. You will experience abundant life and peace if you do things the way that God calls us to do them. If you follow God's way of wisdom, he will lead you to life. How many of you want that tonight? You know, for those of you who are here tonight, you know, you desire to experience this. Maybe it's because you, you've never really submitted your life to Christ. Or maybe it's because you've taken your eyes off of him and put them on these worthless worldly things. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask uh, Terry and Sandy, Jonathan and Deborah to come down now. And for those of you who are here tonight and you need prayer for something, as we always do, we like to give opportunity. I know many of you are going through different things right now in your lives where you need wisdom to navigate those things. And so I just want to give that opportunity. If you need prayer tonight, please come down after we close here in prayer and get prayer. They're here, down here for you to, to pray with you, to encourage you, to build you up. We as God's people need to be here for one another. But I just encourage you to to take a look at your life. Look at the, the direction that you're going in. Look at what you're pursuing and ask yourself, is this what God wants for me? Ask yourself, is, is this glorifying to God? Is this making much of his name? Ask yourself, are, are you experiencing joy? Are you experiencing peace? Are you ex experiencing satisfaction in him? Because if you're not that means your focus is distorted. You're looking at the wrong things. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that you are truly so good, so gracious, abounding in steadfast love and mercy. God, you are a generous God. And your word says that if we pray and ask for wisdom, you will give it to us. Lord, we just desire to pursue the things that are pleasing to you tonight. We desire to navigate this difficult life in the way that honors you and brings glory to your name. But we can't do it on our own, and we humbly confess our mistakes, our flaws, our failures. We confess our, our tendency to wander from you. And God, we ask that you would keep us, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to lead us day by day, to empower us to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. God, I pray a special blessing over each and every person in this room tonight, no matter what they may be going through, no matter what they may be facing, God, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them discernment, that you would give them direction in their everyday lives. God, we thank you that you promise us these things, that you do care so deeply about us in the direction of our lives. Lord, we thank you for your kindness and for your blessings, and we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you tonight. I thank you for coming. I hope you have a wonderful week. And as I said, if you need prayer tonight, please come down. We will be more than glad to pray with you this evening.